Hello and welcome to another Atippling Philosopher video. This is a uh, ATP Geopolitics Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you the extra nuggets and juicy tidbits to get your teeth into to give you the greater understanding for this conflict. Let's start tonight's uh, video, or today, or this morning, depending on where you are listening to this, with Mick Ryan, the Australian retired Australian general, uh, who is... Uh, brilliant on on Twitter and whenever he's interviewed actually he's on uh, mainstream media quite a bit in his analyses of the conflict and of strategy and so on and so forth here he talks about the Ukraine war that he says there is much to the war in Ukraine that we do not see the struggle on the ground is dynamic and the correlation of forces can be unclear this makes predictions about the future trajectory of the war nearly impossible. However, there are certain variables which are likely to have significant impact on the course of the war in 2023. So this is really looking at where the war might go in 2023. I believe there are five main uh, key variables which, depending on the approach to Russia and Ukraine, will shape this war in the coming year. Variable one is effective conservation of ammunition and the capacity of the West to increase defense production. The war in Ukraine is the first in three decades to challenge post-war Cold War defense, industrial and strategic logistic models. So this is interesting. Um, we've talked about how the ISW, Institute for the Study of War, are saying that it looks like there are many indicators that the Russian forces are culminating in Bakhmut, which is to say they've run out of um, momentum, capability, capacity to continue the offensive, and they they need to take an operational pause to regroup, regather, reconstitute, and all those things before maybe c continuing on if they get more, you know, resources, troops, ammunition, whatever. So this is, that is what Mick Ryan is talking about here, which is conservation of ammunition. It appears that one of the indicators of culmination for the ICW, at least, is is that Russia has is running out of ammunition. They've had to move their depots further back from the front line due to high Mars threat, uh, and they've had so many depots and ammunition, you know, storages, warehouses, supply chains. You know, trains, this and that, hit by high Mars, that they are just running short of ammunition. And they have been expending ammunition at an incredible rate right throughout this war. That is now slowing down. The ISW today said that they are firing shells at a third, this is based on uh, Ukrainian uh, intelligence, saying that the Russians are firing shells at a third of the rate they were. Now, in in this kind of area, we've seen other nations around the world ramping up production of Soviet era uh, ordnance for Ukraine. Ukraine have even started manufacturing some of their own. Uh, we've got Bulgaria, some were saying the other day that um, you've got South Korea is ramping up production. That I don't know whether that's of NATO rounds because obviously Ukraine will need, now they're starting to get NATO howitzers, they are going to need NATO ammunition. Uh, an awful lot more of that, as well as, ideally, uh, Soviet-era ammunition to fit both configurations. Um, but this, so therefore, going forward this year, the ammunition is going to be a massive component um, as to how this war goes and who will, uh, who will find success. Drawdowns of forces and consolidations of defence companies in the wake of the Cold War, says McRyan, uh, saw smaller military organisations demanding less equipment and ammunition and stocking less uh, than had been the case for the preceding decades. Of course, you know, uh, back to me, as the as peacetime had become, you know, uh, entrenched, <laughs> to use <laughs> an oxymoronic term maybe, uh, in our modern societies, it, it has been uh, less warranted less justified to spend huge amounts of uh, of our budgets in you know these peaceful nations of the west predominantly uh, spend huge amounts of our budget on you know build manufacturing more ordnance building uh, buying or ordering more mechanized equipment so on and so forth so as as we get used to these peace times we stop demanding so much uh, military equipment and then of course a war comes along and a big war in this case that is expending an absolute shed load of equipment and now suddenly no one has enough equipment 
Uh, and it's completely understandable, uh, but, uh, but this is one of the problems that the, uh, well, the, the Ukrainians are facing uh, and their allies. But consumption rates in Ukraine, says McRyan, of precision munitions, anti-air and anti-tank missiles, as well as ground attack rockets and missiles, has drastically reduced the munitions held by Ukraine, Russia, and many of their allies and partners, as I was just uh, discussing. For some, the solution for the Ukrainians to fight like Americans and use less ammunition, given current shortfalls, uh, this is part of the solution. Uh, what the Americans have done over the recent decades is to not do, not build so many dumb munitions, but concentrate more on smart munitions. And that includes ordnance for howitzers. So the Excalibur shell it might be a more expensive shell, but you need fewer of them because actually they are going to be more accurate. You don't, you're not just blanketing entire areas with dumb. Um, ordnance you are hitting uh, targets with the first shell but you're getting you, you're getting spotting drones telling you the coordinates of a target and you're hitting it with one shell job done you don't need six shells you don't need to walk your shells in so to speak so th that's a kind of american way of doing things it's about accuracy rather than just quantity um as mick ryan continues but even um, oops, I don't know what happened there. Uh, but even with more conservative use of munitions, large amounts of ammunition will be required by Ukraine in offensives to take back occupied territory. The medium term solution to this is to expand the production capacity of Western defense industry. So whether you like it or not, if Ukraine are going to take back the territory they have lost, they need more ammunition. So far, only the US has indicated that it will do so, and this will not take effect for 6 to 12 months. Until then, more effective use of existing munitions stockpiles will be the rule. Unfortunately, the Russians are facing similar problems. This, this might be why we've seen solutions that involve um, modifying dumb munitions, both air-released and ground-released, uh, to create more accurate munitions, uh, because they they have got the, the capacity for that. There are the stocks of these things um, to be able to modify the dumb munitions and turn them into more effective, more efficient, smart munitions. Variable two. The next variable is the ability of Ukraine and Russia to mobilize, train and deploy its troops. Ukraine mobilized its forces early and has been constantly training regular and territorial forces for defensive and offensive operations. And that is, back to me, This that is both in Ukraine and abroad. Uh, the UK I think Czechoslovakia now, uh, Poland, all places are helping to train up. And many countries, Australia, New Zealand, all the countries of Canada, all these countries from around the world, helping to train up Ukrainian troops. Reportedly, mobile, the difference here, of course, is Russia has sent many of its trainers into, into war. And so they are struggling to effectively train mobilized troops up to a sufficient standard. Uh, reportedly, mobilizing, mobilizing around 700,000 troops, uh, Ryan continues, the Ukrainians have an advantage in numbers at this point, as well as motivation for their soldiers. Uh, the Russians, after suffering massive losses in northern Ukraine and the Donbass, finally undertook a partial mobilization from September last year. While initially chaotic, the Russians appear to have streamlined mobilization of, pers uh, of persons to fight in Ukraine. The influx of tens of thousands of new Russian troops and the potential mobilization of more in 2023 presents a challenge for Ukrainian strategy moving into 2023. The ability for either side to most effectively mobilize their people is a key variable in the war. Variable three is a willingness of the West to provide more sophisticated ground and air offensive capabilities to Ukraine. The West has taken a stepped approach to providing sophisticated weapons, avoiding the provision of tanks, fighter aircraft and long range missiles. Part of the theory for this is to ensure that training and logistics can be undertaken to ensure that the air systems provided to Ukraine are supportable over the long term. So let's take an example of this. One might say that America don't want to provide M1 Abrams tanks as main battle tanks because um, it's seen as escalatory. When actually, the more prevalent arguments might be that uh, they would just take far longer to train up the Ukrainian crews, not just on the tanks, but in the supply chain, in, in how to repair these things, and, and getting that very extensive supply chain into Ukraine with spare parts, uh, needing maybe different fuel, all these kind of things these are variables that make just giving equipment far more complicated than that. You know, you, you, it's not a case of like, here's 20 tanks, go for it. 
Job done. We've given you too many tanks. Brilliant. Well done. Go and send them onto the front and uh, shoot at the Russians. It's like, okay, here's 20 tanks. Now we need to train maybe 20 crews or 10 crews so that then they can train 10 other crews and so on and so forth. It's like we need to spend a lot of, a lot of months or weeks at least training these crews on completely different machines and also training the you know the mechanics and training people and how to you know move this stuff around and then get hold of all the spare parts for these and then you know so on and so forth it's just far more complicated than one might think uh, but there have also been some in the US and Europe, continues Ryan, who have seen the provision of more advanced weapons such as tanks and long-range attack and missiles as escalatory, as I was saying. But Ukraine can't win this war by defensive operations only. Absolutely true. At some point, we have to give them the weapons where they can just win the war offensively. We can't just give them weapons to sit there and take wave after wave of Russian attacks. Uh, and then, and then at some point they they go. Well, now we've defeated so many Russian soldiers who have been attacking us. Uh, it's time to attack, but we can't really attack because we don't have the offensive weapons to do so. We've just been sitting here in defense, and that is, you know, never going to get back those occupied territories. So, if the West are serious about Ukraine taking back Ukraine, we need to provide them with the offensive weapons to do so. Ryan continues, a turning point in 2023 will be reached if the West flings off this unnecessary fear, what Elliot Cohen, uh, he's a, a reporter, has called baloney realism and gives Ukraine the offensive capability. It needs to take back all of its territory. And he links to the Atlantic article uh, by Cohen. Variable four, an interesting variable, is the willingness of China to remain neutral in this war. There are several reasons for China's reticence, including trade with the US, but its neutrality it so far has benefited Ukraine. China still imports Russian coal, LNG and oil, providing revenue for Putin's regime. However, should the Chinese decide assisting Russia is more important than its trade relationship with America, it could see a significant shift in Russian fortunes. So this is the idea that Russia, uh, the potential threat of a sanction on Chinese goods into America and arguably with, with other allies is what is keeping China at the moment somewhat neutral uh, at least not providing russia with weapons um, and overtly with components to make weapons um, variable five uh, a final variable is the strategic leadership of zelensky putin and biden and their ability to nurture and sustain the will of their people putin's direction launched this war and Zelensky's leadership has united the nation to resist the Russian onslaught. Biden's leadership has been vital in hardening Western resolve and coordinating the steady flow of aid to Ukraine. Now, I know some of you Republicans who are listening to this are just hate Biden no matter what he does. But actually, for, from an outsider here, uh, and I know I'm I'm sort of pro-Democrat or whatever, but I, my opinion is Biden has done a really good job, given all the range of things he could have done, right? There's a whole range of places he 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 could have sat here. I think he's done a, a pretty good job. And, and also bear in mind that he will be given most of his information and advice from uh, groups of people, including the military, obviously, around him. So much of what Biden's done is actually the will of his military industrial complex, or at least, you know, the armed forces. Uh, and uh, Lloyd Austin said back in April of last year now, um, that. America wanted to do as much as it could to kind of degrade Russian capacity and capability to be able to do this kind of thing again. So there is a theory, and I've talked about this quite a bit, that actually America maybe don't want Russia to lose straight away really easily. That's why they're not giving the big stuff to Ukraine straight away. But they want to degrade Russia in such a fundamental way over quite a long period that they have absolutely no chance of coming back and repeating something like this. And actually, if if that is the objective of, of the US and say Biden here, then I think they've done that more successfully than say allowing Ukraine to just win outright. Um, and actually, you, that way could also be less escalatory than giving Ukraine straight away everything that they needed. If they did that, essentially that, that just looks like it's a war between the US and Russia. So if Zelensky has said to the US, we need everything straight away, which, you know, he pretty much did. And the US had given them everything straight away, much quicker than, say, European allies and other Western allies. Then that would have 
said to Putin, right, this is a war between us and America, and then suddenly you're in World War Three. So I think Biden has, has navigated a very potentially difficult path, and he's done it pretty well. Uh, I And I think now is the time to start pushing the envelope. So I, I've said this recently, like really now is the time, because I don't think it will be seen as escalatory given the last year given what's happened in the last year if we then start giving uh, Zelensky and Ukraine the things they really really need now I don't think that's going to be a problem I don't think Russia will react uh, in, a, in a crazy way so um, uh, so Biden's leadership sorry I, I, I'll go over that again has been vital in hardening Western resolve and coordinating the steady flow of aid to Ukraine so yeah don't underestimate what Biden has also done in terms of galvanizing or y- uniting uh, other nations to this cause. Um, again, I you know I might sound overtly pro Biden to you, and I know there's I there are loads of people on my thread who just hate Biden and will slag off Biden. But actually, if he's your president, maybe take take a take a back take a step back and go. Okay, I'm going to take my Republican hat off here and just go right. Biden has actually gained a lot of political capital from around the world and from Zelensky. And actually, if there are other people outside of my country saying he's doing a good job, maybe I should just go go along with that because actually that means my country is doing a good job to help here. And and rather than sit there and be anti-Biden, sit there and think, uh, could, could some credit be due to Biden? Or if not Biden, you know, his administration, the army, whatever, you know, the, the US. Biden and Zelensky, Ryan continues, will be under great pre- greater pressure from Europe and some in the US Congress to explore peaceful resolutions to the war. Putin, on the other hand, is playing for time, hoping that the West gradually ties uh, ties of the war in 2023. The ability of Biden and Zelensky to keep Europe and America unified is in its support for the Ukrainian war effort in 2023 will be a key variable in the year ahead. There are other variables that might also be considered in the coming year. These include how effective each side is in strategic influence operations, economic factors, or the potential for events in the Indo-Pacific to draw attention and resources away from Ukraine. Nothing in war is certain. Despite some very fine articles that have recently explored scenarios for 2023, we cannot predict future human actions or the outcome of this war. By exploring different variables, however, we might be able to ascertain Russian weaknesses that can be exploited. We might also ensure that the right kinds and quantities of support are provided at the time, uh, at the right time to Ukraine in the coming year. So I thought, thought that was an interesting thread and worth having a little bit of discussion on. So always uh, good to ha- have Mick Ryan's input on stuff. Uh, here is, I just like this because <laughs> it's just been Christmas time and here we have a MiG fighter pilot in what looks like a duffel coat and a Santa uh, hat and beard in his fighter gear um uh, doing a seed operation suppression of enemy air defense and as someone's pointed out here OSINT technical in this case um it, there is several different <laughs> missiles on this the r73 and the agm 88 which is a harm missile so this is used to attack uh radar so it homes in on radar uh emissions if you like um to uh that's probably the wrong word um uh to take out radar installations and there, thereby give eventually air supremacy or, you know, at least air, air superiority to, in this case, Ukraine. Um, so the R-73, the AGM-88 and the Santa hat. So all, always good. Uh, the R-73 are short-range air-to-air missiles. Um, so that is, that will be in case they come across uh, something in the air that's threatening to them. Uh, a Ukrainian MiG-29 makes a standoff seed strike with a pair of US integrated AGM harm missiles, AGM-88. So I'm going to turn that off because I, I got stung today for a copyright infringement. So uh, anyway, there's releasing um, uh, two missiles, one and then the other. Bosch and, and it's gone. So there is a bit of uh, MiG-29 uh, footage. And now he's banking. Just, I just, I'm always just so impressed with this footage. I don't know what it is about cockpit you know, camera footage, but, but yeah. 
This is fascinating. So Prigozhin has visited basements that appear to be full of dead Wagner PMC mercenaries. And one of the things he says at about, was it 24 seconds? Yeah, the contract is over. They will go home. So check this out. This is, this is pretty fascinating. Just the amount of dead in the Bakhmut area. And that's Prigozhin. Making a real half hour sign of the cross there. And uh, contract is over. They can go home. There you go. I mean, see, they're, they're not humans. They're their contract. They're, it's, it's personnel. It's like the worst form of HR, really, just seeing them as personnel, as kind of um, capital expenditure or something in this, you know, transaction that is war. <laughs> I'd love to get uh, I'd see if I can find a, an English translation of this but it's just like you know I wonder what the point of then doing this kind of recording and letting it out because this doesn't paint Wagner in a good light this is, this is a pile of Wagner mercenary bodies in a basement because they've been killed I d yeah I don't get why they would release us just, you know, huge amounts of dead bodies, moving dead bodies around. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, now, I'm going to leave you today pretty much. Uh, no, actually, I will do this bit first and then leave you with Zelensky. So this was a video that no reports in this case showed. He said in Moscow, they celebrated New Year's Eve with a song called Ukraine is not dead yet. And loads of people on, on this thread and 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 elsewhere have, have sort of slagged off the Russians for this. But actually, uh, I think they've got the completely wrong end of the stick. So I don't want to get copyright infringement again, but there they are. They're all dancing around and singing Ukraine is not, uh, is not dead yet, right? And predominantly young people here, actually, so a lot of people are saying this is absolutely terrible. These people are horrible. Oh, I can't believe they're doing all this. But actually, you, you get a lot of comments like this. Just for more clarity, it is Ukrainian folk singer with the wording, if we celebrate like this, Ukraine is not dead yet. So those who are dancing are basically cheering that Ukraine holds and they can be arrested at any minute for this song and dance. So actually, these guys are in support of Ukraine. They're not against Ukraine. It's not, it's not some kind of like song and dance about U Ukrainians being dead or wanting them to be dead. But actually, it's a really dangerous thing to do. And it's probably predominantly young people because it appears, at least anecdotally from what I've seen, that young people seem to be more likely to have a wider variety of information on this, being able to have VPNs and get around and know how to use the internet, so on and so forth. Uh, but also, you know, not having been so set in their ways and having, you know, decades and decades of, of Russian um, propaganda and narrative and state state media uh, just you know, main mainlined into their uh, into their minds. But anyway, uh, I at least you know that's a, that's how I read this. I could be wrong. There are many saying that actually no, you're wrong. These guys, these guys are fine, and other people are saying uh, these guys are terrible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it, but if if that is how I see that, then you know, and she's wearing blue. That might say something. But this is. Is really is dangerous. These guys are on, on, on film now and the FSB could come knocking. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, moving on to this. So Zelensky made a uh, a New Year's speech and I think the air raid sirens might have gone off as he was doing it. Uh, fairly, you know, that's quite a long speech, but uh, I'm going to read some of it to you because I think it's really important and, and really good. Now, a couple of things like... As a speech, 
as a leader of a country. And Winston Churchill in the Second World War was great for this, which is a lot of craft goes into those speeches. They are psychological manipulation for good reason. Speeches are persuasive. They're trying to, or, or they're there to unite you together or for some kind of uh, gain for the, for the speech maker. They're not just like, I'm giving you some information. It's like I'm saying a speech and I'm intending an objective, audience purpose task. Who's my audience? What's my purpose of this speech? And that will inform how I write this speech. You know, this is what, this is how you teach writing, audience purpose and task. The task or the form of what you are, any content creation, including this video actually, who, who are my audience? What's my objective? And that will inform how I create my content. So. Um, Zelensky will start with, okay, what's my objective? What do I want to get out of this? Who are my audience? Right, now let's put a speech together and see if, if we can do that. And then there'll be music overlaid and then et cetera, et cetera. So that it will be emotionally pulling on people's heartstrings or, or, or you know, playing with ideas of courage and unity and all this kind of stuff. Yes, but it's still a brilliant speech and exactly what he needs to do as a leader. This is this is a, a speech that's a lot about internal uh, Ukrainian, you know, a, appealing to Ukrainians themselves. And there'll be elements of people like me reading this as as the English translation transcripts and going, yeah, this is brilliant. What a great leader. So it plays well internationally as well. But I mean, take a look at this guy. Here's a soldier's reaction watching this live. And you understand the craft of Zelensky and his speech maker or speech maker, speech writer, writers. I think there's one guy that mainly helps him, but um, whoever, you know, this is the effect. У великій війні немає маленьких справ, немає непотрібних. Кожен з нас борець, кожен з нас фронт, кожен з нас основа оборони. Uh, and uh, you know, I could play that on and on. Uh, it's ha it's landing. The speech is landing. It's it's successful. It's doing what it's intended to do. And you know, reading it is brilliant. Loads of techniques that I could bore you with uh, with effective use of repetition, effective use of all sorts of stuff. Uh, that's absolutely great. I'm going to read you broadly half of it i mean i think the actual thing went on for about 17 minutes or something but of course he's doing it slowly he's he's going to have it you know cut away to certain things i think and then music and all sorts of stuff but this is this is good stuff so i'm going to join in here about halfway as i say uh i want to say to all of you ukrainians you are incredible see what we have done and what we are doing how our soldiers have been smashing this second army of the world since the first days, how our people stopped their equipment and infantry columns, how an old man used his hands to stop a tank, how a woman knocked down a drone with a jar of tomatoes, how enemy tanks, armored personnel carriers, helicopters, shells were stolen during the occupation, how we fundraised for Shahid hunters, naval drones, armored vehicles, ambulance vehicles, and Bayraktar drones in several hours, how we withstood all threats, shelling, cluster bombs, cruise missiles, darkness, and cold, how we supported each other and the state. Everyone is important in war. Who holds a weapon, the steering wheel of a car, the helm of a ship or plane, a scalpel or a pointer. Everyone who is behind a laptop, who drives a combine harvester, a train, who is at a roadblock and a power plant, journalists and diplomats, utility workers and rescuers, all who are working studying at a university or a school, and even those who are just learning to walk. All this is for their sake, our children, our people, our country. There are no small matters in a great war. There are no unnecessary ones. Each of us is a fighter. Each of us is a front. Each of us is the basis of the defence. We fight as one team, the whole country, all our regions. I admire you all. I want to thank every invincible region of Ukraine. Kharkiv, 
Mutilated but unconquered, you proved to the enemy that being close territorial does not mean being close in mind. Kharkiv is a Ukrainian city, the hero city. I'm going to take a break here. So uh, obviously loads of brilliant persuasive rhetorical technique going on here, uh, evocative, emotive language. Um, but now he's, he, so this is all about uniting Ukraine, right? And he's going to go through individual regions, individual cities that have all played their part, that have all have their own character. I love the way he's gone Kharkiv, which is just to remind you, it, it, north uh, of, of Ukraine, very close to the Russian border, historically you know very close ties to russia and yet he's saying yeah you may be close geographically but you are not close in in mind you know you are a ukrainian city a hero city so as he continues invincible mikolaev heroically withstands all blows the city on a wave that overcomes all storms and again i'm going to interrupt myself again here just great figurative language. We've got Mikhailiv, which is quite a naval sort of port uh, city. It's got a lot of connections to the sea, so he's using like the, the waves and storms there in in his in his language. Uh, to continue, Sumi city and the region. You were one of the first to feel the full scale invasion of the invaders. Sumi region became a bone in their throat for them. Ordinary people made Molotov cocktails, burned enemy columns, took the first prisoners. Sumi region is a force. Dnipro, the support and reliable rear of our front. You received people. You got the lives of wounded soldiers back. Despite constant barrages, Dnipro lives on. Odessa, sunny and friendly, now a fortress, world fortress, which defends us and which defends the world. Feeds it by sending millions of tons of salvation by sea every day because it is Odessa mama. So that's obviously with reference to grain and uh, being so important for literally feeding the world to some extent. It continues, Kherson, you are heroic people. You have been under occupation for more than eight months. No news, no communication, separated from Ukraine. Thousands of you took part in actions against the Russians. You did not know whether we saw it in Ukraine or knew about it. The occupiers lied to you that Ukraine abandoned you and would not fight for you, but you believed and waited despite everything. The face of Kherson is cut by fragments of shells. But the main thing is that we welcome the new year free and together under blue and yellow flags. And therefore, we will restore everything, rebuild everything, just like Chernihiv and Zaporizhia and Kranatorsk and Bakhmut. Those that became a refugee for millions of Ukrainians, Rivne, Ivano Frankivsk, Ternopil, Vinitsia, I thank you. Those who receive and transfer millions of tons of aid from Europe and the world, Lviv, Ushgorod, Chernivtsi, Lutsk, thank you. Those who accept the evacuation of businesses, enterprises, universities, uh, Kamelnitsky, Zhutomir, uh, uh, Kropinvitsky, Poltava, Cherkassi, thank you. And those who are waiting for Ukraine and will wait, Donbass, Luhansk region, Crimea, thanks to you, our warriors. I love this because he's he's including everyone. So he's like, right. We've got our big ones involved in the war, you know, pretty directly. Sumi, Kharkiv. We've got Dnipro right there doing X, Y, and Z. We've got Mikhailiv, Odessa. And he's then saying, the and these other places that are taking on businesses that have had to, you know, um, transfer all, all their workers and all their equipment or whatever, just set up shop in these Western cities that are far safer and away from the front lines. They are playing their part as well. Uh, those who have looked after refugees as well. And and then he goes on to sort of finish, obviously, with the capital, with, with Kiev. Um, and, of course, Kiev region and the city are our heart, which always beats, thanks to you, all our Ukrainians. We are all one family, one Ukraine. This is the year when Ukraine changed the world and the world discovered Ukraine. We were told to surrender. We chose a counterattack. We were told to make concessions and compromises. We are joining the European Union and NATO. This world heard Ukraine, the European Parliament, Bundestag, the UK Parliament, the Knesset, the US Congress. 
The world felt Ukraine, Ukraine in the media, in the hearts of people, at the top of the Google search. The world saw Ukraine on the main squares in Toronto, New York, London, Warsaw, Florence, Sydney and other cities. Ukrainians surprise. Ukrainians are applauded. Ukrainians inspire. Is there anything that can scare us? No. Is there anyone who can stop us? No, because we are all together. It is what we are fighting for, one for each other. The best salute for us is at the warehouses of the occupiers. The best gift is the numbers in the report of the general staff. We, don't, do, we do not know for sure what the new year 2023 will bring us, but ready for anything. New achievements? We'll be happy. New hits? We'll be steadfast. Continuation of the fight? We will fight. And when we win, we will hug. Dear Ukrainians, a few minutes remain until the new year. I want to wish us, all of us, one thing. Victory. And that's the main thing. One wish for all Ukrainians. Let this year be the year of return. The return of our people. Soldiers to their families. Prisoners to their homes. Immigrants to their Ukraine. Return of our lands and the temporarily occupied will become forever free. Return to normal life, to happy moments without curfew, to earthly joys without air alerts. The return of what has been stolen from us, the childhood of our children, the peaceful old age of our parents, so that grandchildren come to visit their grandparents during the holidays to eat watermelons in Kherson and the cherry in Melitopol, so that our cities are free, our friends are faithful. And so that our main figure and main success appeared in reports near the figure of 100,000 destroyed enemies, thousands of units of destroyed Russian equipment. It is 603,628 square kilometres, the area of independent Ukraine as it was since 1991, as it will always be. May the new year bring all this. We are ready to fight for it. That's why each of us is here. I'm here, we are here, you are here, everyone is here, we are all Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine, Happy New Year. That's an incredibly well-crafted speech with all sorts of elements um, that you could talk about. I think the one big thread though is unity so you know the very last sentences there i'm i'm here we are here you are here everyone is here we are all ukraine the talk about um all the different types of people involved in the conflict in the defense all the different cities and regions involved it's it's this because we are all together it's what we are fighting for one for each other that this is a speech of unity and it was an absolutely brilliant speech in my opinion let me know what you think i didn't obviously read it all to you but hopefully you you get a real sense of that you can you can go and watch it on youtube with english subtitles but i thought i'd read it to you to give you a sense of um i i guess well at least this the way i would read that of course it would work differently in ukrainian and he wanted to have his own inflection and intonation and whatnot but you know there you go uh, hopefully that was of uh, some interest uh, uh, and a good way to start this new year, which is with the words of Zelensky. Um, anyway, there you go. That's today's extra. Um, thank you so much for everything. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. All the ways that you can support the channel are in the description below. Um, I will speak to you tomorrow. In the meantime, uh, take care and stay safe.